on June 8th, Israel, alongside the United States, conducted what it is calling one of the most successful rescue operations that it has undertaken since the October 7th, what some call a prison break, others call a terrorist attack, depending on where you sit on the line. But uh, four Israeli captives were, uh, uh, I guess, uh, uh, freed by Israel, but they killed three that we know of. And not only this, but 270 plus Palestinians were killed at the Nesurat uh, refugee camp. And the United States was heavily involved in this operation. There were some who were speculating, although the U.S. denies this, that the pier that we saw half floating in the sea uh, just a couple weeks ago, uh, some uh, speculated that that pier, and there's video footage that uh, kind of makes it a little um, uh, uh, very uh, legitimate to speculate this, that that pier was being used to essentially... Uh, aid Israel in what was a massacre rather than a military operation. Can you talk about your reaction to this and where does it fall within where Israel stands right now in this broader uh, war that you could call it, a genocide, others call it, um, uh, in Gaza? Uh, how, what does this really reflect? First of all, we, 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 I think we need to be honest about what happened. It was a military operation designed to uh, free um, Israeli citizens who were being held against their will by Hamas. We can call those people hostages, if you want to use that term, prisoners of war, if they were military, if they were civilian, hostages. Um, you know, and, and on, on, you know, on the face of it, um, of course Israel has a right to do that. I know there's the argument, you know, oh, it's an illegal occupier. I use that argument all the time. You can't argue, you can't uh, complain when the enemy, when when people resist you and all that kind of stuff. I agree. But if Hamas, I mean, the whole purpose of Hamas taking the hostages was to bring them into Gaza and compel Israel to carry out military operations designed to free the hostages. That's what this whole thing is about. And so Israel, this has become a political problem for Israel. And this is what we need to focus on, is the political problem of the hostages. It's been one of the issues that have been hounding uh, the Netanyahu administration. Uh, indeed, as we speak, his government is collapsing around him. Uh, Benny Gantz, the uh, minister of defense, um, you know, one of his key uh, political opponents, has left the uh, war cabinet. He's no longer part of the government. Um, he's been followed by at least three others. Um, and this may lead to, um, you know, Israel being compelled to carry out elections in a time of war. Um, Netanyahu is under a lot of pressure to resign because he's not defeating Hamas. He's not defeating Hezbollah. He's not ending this uh, confrontation. Iran got the better of him, uh, you know, and yet he... He knows that if he doesn't do something, he's going to have to. It, it, it's inevitable that he'd be pushed out. So this operation was designed to buy him time. It was a successful hostage rescue operation. That's how it's being spun, that he, Benjamin Netanyahu, is the brave Israeli leader that will never give up on hostages. I mean, this is a tremendous propaganda victory for Israel in Israel. And it's something that the Israelis desperately needed as a nation. Uh, you look at the videotapes of the lifeguards announcing uh, the rescue over the radio to all the people on the beach in Tel Aviv and how they're cheering and clapping. I mean, this is a big deal. This is a much needed boost in the arm from Benjamin Netanyahu, which tells you everything you need to know about why he did it. Because let me tell you this, this is the worst hostage rescue operation um, in the history of hostage rescue operations. Um First of all, there is no military necessity for this operation. Uh, it's clear that the four hostages who were released were being well-fed. Um, they weren't being tortured. They weren't being raped. They weren't uh, being, not, again, they're being held against their will, and I'm not legitimizing this whatsoever. Uh, no matter how much I support the Hamas uh, cause, I understand the reality that if you seize citizens of another nation, don't be surprised when that other nation comes in looking for those citizens through use of force. So. You know, Israel had every right to do what it's doing, um, but not how it did it. You see, it's 
these hostages could have been released through negotiation, the acceptance of a ceasefire. In fact, as the Security Council just voted in support of uh, the American proposal for a ceasefire in Gaza, one which has a hostage uh, release uh, component built into it. Um, so all Israel had to do, there was no military necessity. These hostages weren't being executed. The only hostages that have died in Hamas are hostages who died because Israel fired missiles through one of the surviving hostages. Talk about that, how she knows that Israeli missiles killed uh, Israeli hostages. Uh, the only the only hostages that died died at the hands of the Israeli Defense Force. Um, all of these hostages could have been released simply by Israel agreeing to a ceasefire um, on terms to bring about an end to the conflict. Israel wouldn't do this. So you can't speak of military necessity. There was political necessity, and that's never a justification. Uh, just because Benjamin Netanyahu needs a shot in the arm doesn't ever justify this. What made this uh, assault a um, a crime under international humanitarian law, under the laws of war, under the Geneva Conventions, um, proportionality is a um, is a factor that has to be um, you know brought into play when talking about carrying out strikes that could result in civilian casualties. You know, the law of war doesn't say that you can't kill civilians. What it says is that the Losses of civilians must be in proportion to the military gain achieved by the operation. And since I already told you there was no military uh, imperative here, no military gain, uh, that means that no civilians could be killed. There's no reason to kill any, let alone over 200 um, you know, plus. I mean, I, I don't know what the exact number is now, over just over 240, I think, uh, dead um, no, that's unacceptable. And it's not just, here's the interesting thing, it's not just me saying this or the International Court of Justice or the International Criminal Court. In 2004, the Israeli Supreme Court, the Israeli Supreme Court talked about proportionality, uh, saying that Israel doesn't have a right to go in and carry out operations that uh, will result in, you know, significant civilian life, um, you know, and ignore the proportionality a question. And so we have a massive war crime that took place. There's no defending this whatsoever. There's not a court of jurisdiction that uh, if it took up this case, wouldn't find against Israel here because literally there's no aspect of this that meets the proportionality uh, aspect of it. But there's also the, the, what this did to America and the reputation of the United States. I don't think there's a person out here um, who follows this, who looked at what America was doing with this pier off the coast of Gaza and said, that's a brilliant idea. Why didn't I drink the V8 and get this one, man? If I had just drank in a V8, I could have come up with this idea. And it's genius. I mean, let's spend 340 some odd million dollars and build a pier where we could uh, get humanitarian stuff to come off, and and it goes to the Palestinian people. But oh wait, it doesn't really, does it? Uh, because there's not too much to come off. The pier is very fragile. Windstorm comes up, pier gets washed away. All noble events, guys. Go study the Battle of Normandy. We just had the 80th anniversary of the Battle of Normandy, um, and study the concept of Mulberry Harbors, and. Um, what that means protecting you know artificial man-made um piers or jetties um from weather um right after d-day the, the 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 weather came in and swept away blew up the mulberry harbors and it screwed up the whole offloading that was supposed to take place we know that it's almost impossible to do that i'll give away something about my background too um in the lead up to the gulf war i was on a um on a uh, planning cell working directly for the Commandant of the Marine Corps uh, to plan uh, combat options, amphibious warfare options for uh, the Marine Corps because you know General Schwarzkopf at that time had two Marine divisions assigned and his whole thing was put the Marines right up against the strongest Iraqi defenses and charge straight into the uh, lines. Now, Marines aren't cowards. We've done this before. We could do it. But, you know, we sat there and went, we really don't want to build another Iwo Jima memorial about the Iraq war. There's got to be a better way to use Marines. We're 
instead of putting us on the ground like two army divisions. Uh, we're an amphibious force. And so one of my concepts, uh, actually it was a concept that I came up with, was to take a core-sized element and insert it on the al Peninsula and then advance rapidly into the Iraqi rear, cutting off the al Zubair logistics base from Baghdad to the Kuwaiti forces, putting them in the horns of a dilemma where if they left their trenches, they'd get bombed. If they stayed in place, they'd starve to death. Uh, classic amphibious operation kind of stuff. And the, the problem we had was there's no port facility. There's Umm Qasar, but that easily mined, et cetera. How do you get Marines over the beach fast enough, ready to fight? Um, we, I came up with the idea that we're going to build – this is actually a pretty clever idea. I'm pretty proud of it. Um, we're going to build a, a pier, but the way we're going to build the pier is you take what's called a roll-on, roll-off ship. And uh, you take the first roll-on, roll-off ship. On that ship, you have a Marine rifle company already lined up in its combat march order. Um, and that ship comes in and runs aground on the beach. CBs come out and improve that front, and then the companies ride off. Now, roll-on, roll-off allows vehicles to enter the back and roll out the front. And then behind it comes another roll-on, roll-off that comes in and links up with this one. And that company leaves its ship, goes on the other ship in. We're building a pier, and we just keep lining them up all the way across. There it is. And we have three of these things because you need – you know, things. And this, this, this came up in the mind of a stupid captain. Um, and it passed muster. Everybody said it was genius. We're going to do it. But one of the things we were concerned about was whether, you know, what, okay, we got this, we got these ships all linked up like some giant centipede. And what happens if the weather comes in and just blows the crap away? And I didn't have the answer for that. My, my answer was we need to basically get a division on shore and have a regiment peel off and secure Um Kasser, and then we would use the Um Kasser port facilities. And that was the plan, because we didn't have time to build a Mulberry Harbor to protect it. If bad weather had come in, it could have caused problems. But what I'm trying to point out is that people who do this for a living plan these things, we know. We know what the history of military operations are. And anybody sitting there trying to put a pier off of uh, Gaza has to know about weather, has to know about tidal surges, has to know about every aspect of it. Um, that's why we have, you know, intelligence officers who are supposed to have tasked the divers to go in and put in sensors and check the water flow and check everything out and make sure that all the calculations are done so the pier is done. It's the dumbest idea in the world to put this pier in, which now you have to ask the question, well, why did they put the pier in? Because the pier is ideally located to gather intelligence against Hamas, to provide an observation platform into uh, areas of, uh, of Gaza um, where you can do visual observation and you can do um, technical surveillance of, uh, of this. And it's done by the United States in coordination with Israeli intelligence. It's also a perfect staging ground. We talk about getting humanitarian goods in there but it allows um, vehicles to be staged that operate under the cover of humanitarian operations. We know that the Israelis used humanitarian vehicles to deploy their troops. Um, one of the trucks was um, designed to mimic um, the, the transfer of displaced persons uh, you know, that, that move around. And there's no doubt in my mind that the Israelis probably rehearsed this, meaning they sent you know, fake runs through the area just to get the locals used to seeing this kind of vehicle moving. But this came off of the pier. Uh, so the Israeli forces deployed to the pier disguised as American forces, and then they fell in on these um, on, on these vehicles and they deployed uh, in, in the United States, what had to have been involved in the command and control, the logistics, the planning of this. So the United States was involved in this operation that turned into a war crime because they slaughtered over 220 civilians to rescue four hostages. They killed at least three other hostages. Um, if this had been an American operation, I can guarantee you that be, there would be a congressional inquiry and there would be court martials of the officers in charge. This was not a military success, not at all. 
They killed three hostages, one of whom is an American. I don't know why the United States Congress isn't outraged. The one question I would ask is, how did this come to be? Did we know the Israelis were going in after an American citizen? What measures did we do to, to protect this American? Uh, why did we allow the Israelis to carry out a military operation to rescue an American citizen when, if they simply did the ceasefire, this person could have been freed uh, with, without any harm? What, you know? And then the, the, the final one is, why did we allow the uh, Israelis to commit war crimes? And here's the interesting part. Nobody's talking about this. There's something called the Leahy Law, um, named after the, the, the former senator, I believe, from the state of Vermont. I could be wrong on that one, uh, Patrick Leahy. Um, the Leahy Law uh, prevents America from providing um, money uh, to units, military units of a nation that we're providing support to who have committed what are known as gross violation of human rights. Well, what happened in this hostage rescue is a gross violation of human rights. So all of the elite Israeli special forces units, Yaman, uh, Sayyid Matkal, uh, there's a number of others that were involved in this. All of those now, by law, by American law, have to be reviewed. Um, because if they committed gross violation of humanitarian of, of, of human rights, which they did by disregarding the notion of proportionality, then we can't give them money. We can't work with them. We have to ostracize them. Um, is this happening? The answer is no. See, America ignores its laws, and now we come to the final outcome of this. This has destroyed the reputation of the United States as a as an impartial arbiter. Uh, we can never again be trusted. Um, we we can only be seen as unilaterally supporting Israel across the board. Uh, when we create an object, a peer, that we say is for humanitarian purposes, and then we use it uh, for military purposes, who can trust us again? This was a one-time operation. They're not going to be able to launch another operation like this using this peer. This was a one-of uh, which means you have to question then what about this was so important. Was it really so important to get four hostages rescued when over 120 remain in captivity? And the answer is yes, from a political standpoint. This was an act of political desperation by Benjamin Netanyahu. Uh, he was so desperate that he basically burned the, 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 um, the pier. The pier can't be used like this anymore. And it really can't be used as an intelligence gathering thing because your visual observations now have to operate under the assumption that Hamas knows they're being watched. Therefore, what you're seeing is probably deception. And the, the signals, likewise, false signals are going to be coming, complicating your analysis. We, we compromise the whole thing for the worst hostage rescue mission in modern uh, Israeli history. Thank you for tuning in to my latest video. I appreciate all of your support. This channel, however, needs your help. I am seeking to make this channel more sustainable in the long term and upgrade necessary equipment to ensure that this work continues onward and makes progress to give you all of the geopolitical analysis that you all deserve. For that reason, I'm asking you to become a member of my Patreon community at patreon.com slash Danny Haifong. You can find that link in the video description or in the pinned comment below. For whatever amount you choose to give, just know you are supporting independent media that you can't find anywhere else. Thank you so much and I look forward to the next video.